I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we conclude our investigation into the Jason Landry disappearance. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my unprecedented co-host, Alice. Unprecedented? Well, thank yeah. you. That's not true, but, you know, I'll take it. You, it's been a long day, You are day, de novo, so. Alice. <laughs> de novo. De novo <laughs> review. There you go. That's you. De novo that review was... of crime. That was a very nerdy law joke. Mm, Thanks for so all nerdy. of you who put up with Brett's nerdiness. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Brett's nerdiness? What are you talking oh, okay. about, Alice? <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I'm sorry. I'm not going to leave you hanging over there by yourself. If only you knew Alice better. Of course, we already know <laughs> Alice very well at this point. There's like no limit to what Alice does. I forget what it was I learned about you most recently. I don't know. There's so much. I don't, I don't remember. But you made fun There's of me so about much. it. You worked oh, on a farm. Oh, that I farmed. I worked yeah. on a farm. Who has Was that one of the episodes that we talked about that? Or was no. that just somewhere? No. No, it was one of our advertisers asked. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure our advertisers yeah. are like, what? Is she just making up stuff? Yeah. I was like, I've seen a farm before. And Alice is like, I once worked on a, a sustainable farm for, I don't know how long you did it, three it's, years or something. Who, it's like, how do you hasn't? have enough time in your life? To have done all the things. No, who hasn't? Everyone in their 20s did some sort of wolfing, right? You know, the organization wolfing? where you... Yeah, wolfing. It, I did not wolf. wolf like, but wolf. Let me wolf. see what it's called. Wolf uh, <laughs> farming. No, you've never heard of it? Wolfing? It's no. W-W-O-O-F, Worldwide Opportunities wolf? on Organic Farms. Uh. Y'all out there, if you have a gap year or just want to start your new life, you should join a farm anywhere in the world. It's called wolfing. You can Google it. I'm wolfing. not making it up. Yeah, it's amazing. If I like was unattached and didn't have, you know, bills and a, and children to take care of, I'd do this. You can't wolf around the house, wolf in the backyard, <laughs> or whatever. I don't, I don't think that's exactly what it means, but I see what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I'm, gonna I, say, I, I'm not I, making fun of wolfing. I think this sounds oh, no, really I, interesting. I did try to plant some rosemary in my backyard, and my boys promptly ripped it up and mm. proudly told me that he had pulled some weeds. And I was like, "Darn, <laughs> those are my <laughs> rosemary bushes." They were they were so proud, though. I didn't want to like crush yeah. their little spirits, you know. Children and deer are bad for the. Uh, they the are, garden. but you know you can shoot deer. I'm sorry for those of you who don't think you can shoot deer. Uh, or you can at least put out things that detract them. You can you shoot really deer can't around do that here. Kids. You, yeah, that's true. You can't shoot <laughs> that's deer. True. That's true. That's true. You matter. really cannot put up poison for your kids. Mm -mm. You know, you can't put them in a cage either. There's all sorts of things <laughs> you can't do with your kids. You know, <laughs> so like, frowned upon. My dog loves his crate, and wouldn't it be nice if these kids just love their crate? But there's no crates in my house for the. Kids <laughs> I was gonna say, did you just did you, you just can't say crate something that you kids. should know? <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna get a lot of hate for saying you can shoot sure deer. Let me this, just be clear, uh, Brett. Let me just be clear for a second. I've never shot a deer. I've never shot anything mm -hmm. actually. Just, let's just not talk about what you've done with chickens. I think we lost like half oh, our audience. No, that, that come episode. on. That was in the name of making friends internationally. Uh -huh. Right. Yes. Yes. That was not how a lot of people saw it. A lot of that was. It really bothers some true. folks. I mean, we lose we lose, we lose listeners for all sorts of reasons. But that was like <laughs> that was that was definitely an early road bump. Road bump? I know. The, uh, I, speed bump. Well, oh, whatever. I was just being case. honest with our listeners. It happened. I was unsuccessful in killing a chicken, and I have never tried again. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, everybody's wondering what's happened to us and why we're talking about all this stuff. But this is just, you know. <laughs> this will be like, cut. Yeah, this will all go to the bloopers stuff. So those of you who enjoy the bloopers <laughs> will hear all this eventually. Anyway, well, Alice, we are back today to talk more about... 
this really incredibly mysterious case, the Jason Landry case. And just to give you some background for those of you who may have forgotten since it has been a week, Jason Landry is a 21-year-old kid, normal guy, nothing extraordinary about him. It's coming up on Christmas time. It's basically the same time of year as it is now. And he's been in college, and it's the COVID year, and it hasn't been great. He's been kind of isolated because of all the COVID restrictions, and he's really ready to get home. He's ready to see his family. On December 13th, he strikes off with his, his pet fish and his PlayStation and wearing his flip-flops and his t-shirt and shorts and heads off into the Texas night and something goes horribly wrong and his car is found on this lonely, dirt, gravel, Texas road and Jason has never been seen since. So we talked a little bit about Jason's drug use and how it was limited to marijuana as far as we know. It doesn't seem like it was a big deal, but that's based on what his dad told us. And, and who knows? I mean, it's possible his dad doesn't, didn't know. It's possible his dad didn't know that he was using stronger substances. And it makes you wonder, is it possible that Jason was meeting someone on that dark road and maybe something went horribly wrong? Maybe he didn't take a wrong turn. Maybe he was going exactly where he intended to go, and we'll talk about that some when we get to the theories in this case. The other question that we've sort of touched on is why were his clothes, including the clothes he was wearing that day, all in the middle of the road? It appears that everything Jason was wearing, down to his underwear and his watch, he just took off and left in the middle of the road. Was Jason just walking down the road naked? Was that happening? And if he was, why was he doing that? And also, uh, you know, there aren't many people here, um, but there's no sightings of a naked man walking around. I mean, this is very rural. He may have just walked into, a, you know, someone's land and gotten lost in the brush. But it would certainly be a strange sight to see someone completely naked walking in winter. You know, it's still cold in Texas. Um, at in the middle of the night, but there are no such sightings. Yeah, and remember, yeah, there's not a lot of people on that road, but it only took an hour for his car to be found. The The firefighter drove by only an hour later, so it's not as if nobody was driving down that road, and you got to believe if someone had seen that, they would remember it. Right. And now we've talked a little bit about the weather. It's possible the weather answers this question. We do know that it was a cold night, incredibly cold for a Texas night. Jason's dad, you know, drove there just a couple hours after he got word of the crash. And he said it was kind of an uncharacteristically cold, bitter cold night. The, the wind was blowing at 20 miles per hour and the wind chill was below freezing. And... Could Jason have had hypothermia and engaged in paradoxical undressing? We've talked about this a little bit, especially in the Dyatlov Pass case. It's possible, I think this back windshield was was broken open, and so uh, he would have not been protected from the elements after the crash. And if he had been knocked out, he may have been in that state for even a couple minutes could really chill a a uh, car that's not uh, doesn't have his windows right and this wind is blowing you can imagine he's knocked out wakes up freezing quite literally freezing because the temperature is below freezing and paradoxical undressing is this kind of strange phenomenon physiologically where even though your body is incredibly cold and is fighting hypothermia it tells your brain that it's hot so that you take off your clothes hence the name paradoxical undressing now, that could explain the clothes in the road that's not very far from his car. Maybe he was like, ah, oh, he comes to, I got to get help, you know, kind of forces his way out of the car door, cuts himself on the barbed wire, starts stumbling away and thinks, oh, geez, I am so hot and just takes off all his clothes. That's a theory of what could have happened. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting one. And I generally hate paradoxical undressing as a theory because I feel like people overuse it. The question I would have, and it's not a question I was really able to answer, is whether or not there was enough time for this to happen. So 
it's about an hour from when his phone goes off and when his car is found. So you take off some of the time for him to get in the wreck, then he's out in the elements for that period of time. Is that enough time for the hypothermia to have taken hold of him to such an extent that he would engage in this paradoxical undressing? Right. And if one of you with medical backgrounds can tell us if it can happen that quickly, we'd love to hear hear about that. We've talked a lot about Jason, and if you're looking at our YouTube page, you can see a picture of him. Jason is described as being six foot one. He weighs about 170 pounds. He has brown hair, brown eyes, and facial hair. And he has not been seen since the night of December 13th. Now, anyone with information about Jason's disappearance can call the Caldwell County Sheriff's Office at 512 512- Three nine eight six seven seven seven. This is a very recent case. There may be someone on that road, maybe one of those houses who heard something that they didn't think was important at the time, or maybe you drove by the site later on that day or that week and noticed something that the police didn't, or maybe you talked to Jason on campus days leading up to this and have a little bit of insight into how he was feeling or doing or what his plans were for going home for the holidays. If you think you have something that can help investigators reach an answer for his family, please call that number. Again, it's 512-398-6777. And, you know, we have so many cases that are pretty old and there's so many cases where we wish people had had more focus on them earlier on and, and whatever happened to them where it's a disappearance or a murder. Well, this is, this one's about as new as it gets. It's not as new as it could be, but it's less than a year. So we really hope you guys, if you have any information, we have a lot of listeners in Texas. It's probably our most popular state at this point. And hopefully some of you who are out there listening, this jogs some sort of memory and we can get to the bottom of this. But until then we have a mystery. So what are some of the theories about what might have happened in this case? I think the first one we can talk about is whether or not Jason was carjacked. So remember, essentially Jason comes to a light somewhere in Luling and all of a sudden his ways cuts off. He's looking at a a Snapchat and then we never see him again. Well, it's possible. It's very late. It's possible Jason comes to a light. Someone jumps him and takes his car, and it's possible that they made him drive down this sort of abandoned road and then killed him. Of course, there are some major problems with that theory. First of all, there's no evidence of it. It's complete speculation. No one saw anything like this. There may be some rumors of it around Luling. There's a lot of rumors about this case, as there always are, but there's nothing concrete. And the biggest strike against it, there's all this stuff and it's still there. So if you have somebody who who carjacked Jason and then staged this wreck, why'd they do that? They didn't take the car. They didn't take the computer. They didn't take the PlayStation. They didn't take the phone. And they left this sort of inexplicable, inexplicable mystery. And I'll just tell you, if they had just taken the backpack, that would be a piece of evidence pointing towards possible foul play. But it wouldn't answer this thing. If everything else we told you was true, but the backpack was missing, the assumption would just be that Jason took the backpack. So there's no reason for them to leave that backpack behind. And if this is a crime for the purpose of you know, money or whatnot, why didn't they steal anything? And why did they go to the trouble of hiding Jason's body? There aren't that many carjackings that end in a person disappearing altogether. I think what you would find if this were carjacking and the people didn't care about taking the car, they'd gotten what they wanted, you would have found Jason dead in the car. You would not have found this mystery the way it is. Now, another theory is that Jason was hit by a drunk driver. Rumors around the area have suggested that Jason may have been struck by a drunk driver while walking down the road. And, you know, after getting in the crash, maybe he was walking to get help at the nearest gas station. And because it's a dark road, someone just hit him by accident. This person, afraid of the consequences, hid the body and drove off. Of course, once again, other than local speculation, there is no evidence of this. There's no area of the road that indicates someone was hit and seriously injured, although the police, we know, didn't do kind of a bang-up job of searching. But 
There's no like drag marks or, or blood on the ground. And this doesn't explain anything about the clothes. Did Jason take all of his clothes off and start walking down the road naked when he was hit? Or was he hit and then somehow no blood was on his clothes, but it was a deadly hit? He was undressed by his assaulter, I guess. I mean, it's possible, but I, I think it's really unlikely. The, the clothes is just such a mind-boggling piece of information. So while this may seem like a good theory, I don't think it's very likely. And I think this is this case is a good example of both sort of an Occam's razor type case, but also just a case where the evidence, even even if you don't have direct evidence of what happened, the evidence you do have seems to eliminate some possibilities. The the close is important because you if you believe something like this happened, if you believe he was hit by a drunk driver and his body was hidden, then you also have to believe that the clothes were just completely unrelated and inexplicable. So, like Al said, you know, he took his clothes off for whatever reason. Maybe he's paradoxical undressing, but that didn't kill him. He was hit by somebody driving down the road. Not impossible. I mean, those would be some pretty significant coincidences if both things happened. Not impossible, but the fact of the clothes seems to tell you that whatever happened is related to the clothes. The clothes seem connected to it, and the hit and run by the drunk driver or any driver just isn't isn't part of that. And the clothes, they have a very small amount of blood on them, not enough from somebody who was hit by a car. And there's none of the other sort of obvious indicia that he was wearing these clothes when he was struck by this car. So another possibility is that Jason went the wrong direction and came upon something he shouldn't have seen. You know, maybe he takes this wrong turn or really just keeps going straight. He's driving down this road, hoping he'll find the interstate or some other major road. And he comes upon a drug deal or he comes upon some drug traffickers. Obviously, we've talked about the importation of drugs from Mexico and other places south of the border. This would be the kind of place that drugs might pass through. And you could imagine he's driving down the road and just runs across something that he shouldn't see. Kind of the same thing that people suspect might have happened in the Brandon Lawson case. So he backs up. He's trying to escape. He he comes upon this thing. He realizes it's trouble. He throws the car in reverse and he runs into the tree. So it's not so much him spinning out. It's actually him backing up. He's forced out of the car at gunpoint and then he's forced to strip maybe to make sure he doesn't have a phone on him or anything else. And then afterwards he's taken somewhere else and killed. The best evidence for this, really the only evidence for this, is the fact of all his things abandoned along the road. A drug cartel would not care about his PlayStation, but it is possible, and you could imagine them doing something like that. It's both a method of control and a method to make sure someone doesn't have any weapons or communications devices, just make them strip their clothes off. Possible? Probably not likely. Right. While they may not care about his valuables, they may care about his phone because that may be the way in which... He could have called for help. They don't know whether he's called anyone or told anyone of what's happened. So we often see in these sorts of cases, even if the um, aggressor doesn't care about valuables, they may take any method of evidence capturing that could place them at the scene, crime of the scene. This kind of naturally leads to our next theory, which is that Jason was going to a drug deal himself and that drug deal went wrong. It's an obvious possibility that Jason was stopping by to pick up some drugs on his way home for Christmas. Recall, Jason gets a Snapchat and then turns off his ways. Could the Snapchat message have been confirmation of a drug deal? Well, there are problems with this theory. First, Jason was not a big-time drug dealer from any anyone that's been interviewed. There's no indication that he was a drug dealer or a big-time one at that. He smoked some pot, and he had a few joints in his backpack, but he didn't live in Luling or this area, and he'd only been through this area twice before. People typically don't buy their drugs an hour drive away from their college. In fact, I think he'd probably have a much easier time buying pot on a college campus than the middle of nowhere on a rural, unpaved road with just a few houses. And one other thing that um, Jason's dad was able to clear up for us is it's he, he believes it's completely settled that the Snapchat Jason received was from that 
you know, ex-girlfriend who was still, he was still on friendly terms with, and it was just a totally normal kind of throwback picture. It was not some coded message to pull off onto Salt Flat Road for an exchange of drugs. Yeah, and this is one of those sexy theories. This is one of those sexy theories that you hear people suggest. In a lot of cases that on the surface kind of feels like maybe it fits everything, seems interesting, but it takes very little investigation to for it to fall apart. We certainly see people set up drug deals on things like Snapchat, coded messengers, uh, messengers where messages del- delete after a certain amount of time. I mean, that's that's obviously a way to set up any kind of clandestine activity. So, you know, hey, and the way he's going off right as the Snapchat goes on, maybe you feel like, oh, he gets the message, and so he does the thing. But like Alice said, his dad seems to have ran that down. We seem to know exactly who the Snapchat was from. Uh, the Snapchat from the girlfriend matches the time exactly where the ways goes off. So unless, once again, you have a really big coincidence where he's getting a message from his drug dealer and from his girlfriend at the exact same time, it doesn't seem likely. And then, as Alice said, he was in college. He could have bought drugs anytime he wanted to. You know, as we've said before, it's hard to just find some random person to sell you drugs. And why he would drive all the way to Luling to take care of that problem, I don't I don't know. So, uh, you know, can you rule it out entirely? Probably not. Is it likely? No, it's not. Alice, before we continue, I want to talk about one of our favorite sponsors, Felix Gray. Guys, it's the holiday season. People are buying gifts. Black Friday has just happened. But it's time for you to treat yourself to a gift. Treat yourself to the blue light glasses that started it all. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized our eyes weren't meant to look at screens all day. And they designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable and the workday more productive. Now, more than ever, Americans are spending more time on computers, phones, tablets, gaming devices, and so many other sources of blue light. Felix Grey glasses are not like the other blue light lenses. They filter 15 times more blue light that can make screen time tough on eyes and disruptive to sleep. Absolutely, Brett. You know, when I got my Felix Grey glasses, I could tell a huge difference. Because we stare at computer screens all day for our jobs, I could tell my eyes were sore, they were burning, they'd be watery. I would get these headaches and sore necks and shoulders just from staring at the computer. I didn't realize it was the blue light making me feel those symptoms. But after I started wearing my Felix Grey glasses, those symptoms were greatly alleviated, which is why I'm excited to get them for my family uh, members for presents this holiday season. And the great thing is they come in non-prescription and prescription lenses. You can check them out now at felixgrayglasses.com slash TP. I personally have loved my crystal Sazerac frames, but there are so many to choose from. They offer classic frame styles made from acetate and hand finished for a durable, lightweight, and really comfortable pair of glasses. With their 30-day money-back guarantee, there's nothing to lose but eye strain. So get yourself a pair of glasses made for the 21st century and designed for modern, hard-working eyes. You have nothing to lose except maybe eye strain. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash TP for the best blue light glasses on the market. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash TP. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges, felixgrayglasses.com slash TP. Now, the problem with all these criminal theories is that no one has talked, right? Underlying all of these theories, there's someone else involved, someone who was part of a crime. And there's been no chatter, no jailhouse informants, no... um, you know, if if you're engaged in some sort of drug trade, usually there is interaction with the police on maybe some other matter, and then you start selling each other out in order to get a lesser sentence. It's just hard to believe that someone involved in this crime wouldn't have said something by this point. And that leaves us with just sort of the natural causes to explanations for this. And one of those we've sort of already hinted at, and that's that Jason just sort of wandered off and died somewhere, and his body just still hasn't been found. 
I mean, if Jason didn't meet with foul play, then maybe this really is just an accident. And it's possible that when he got in this car wreck and he knocks the windows out, he knocks himself out as well. And so he's sitting there in his car. The broken window is allowing in all this cold air. And Jason, much like I used to do whenever I drive home, he was not dressed for the season. He was wearing, remember, it's cold. We talked about how cold it was. He was wearing a short sleeve shirt, shorts, and flip flops. He would have gotten cold very quickly. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I said earlier, I'm not sure how long it takes you to begin experiencing hypothermia, but his clothes weren't going to prevent it. So you could imagine he's in the car, knocked out, getting colder and colder, and that by the time he wakes up, he's very cold. He's in the grips of hypothermia. He gathers some things, but he's not really thinking clearly. I mean, it's possible he also hit his head. Could have been a combination of things. Could have been a combination of hitting his head and the cold. So he doesn't think to grab his phone. And he starts walking down the road. But very quickly, as he's moving for the first time, this paradoxical undressing hits him. So he's been cold. He's now finally starting to to move around. And what's really happening here is the blood is all, it's all flowed to his chest to keep his vital organs warm. And then as he's moving, he just feels hotter and hotter and hotter. And so he starts taking his clothes off. Then he strips all the way down to he's naked. And then as his temperature drops, maybe he leaves the road to find somewhere to get warm. To get warm. Maybe he sort of burrows down, tries to get under something. And he lays down in the field underneath something. And that's where he is to this day. I think that's... We talked about with Mara Murray the possibility that she just wandered off into the woods. I think this is a similar theory to that, just that somewhere in those five miles between where he was wrecked and Luling, if you searched, you'd find his body. Now, this is a really rural area, really rural area. It's a rough terrain. It's a difficult terrain. There's a lot of animals. There's a lot of pigs possible that it would be very difficult to find a body in this circumstance and that might be why people have to this point not had much success despite what have been some pretty thorough searches the second possibility is sort of a a slight tweak on that so it's possible that jason walked towards light So near where Jason crashed, there was a very small hill. Now, given that he was about five miles down the road from Luling, he might have figured that he could not make it back to town in the cold. So, yes, he's hit his head. Yes, he may be dealing with some hypothermia that's going to lead to some paradoxical undressing, but he might still have been within his right mind enough, or maybe this was one of the few things that sort of got through to him, to know that five miles down the road in his state's a long way. And maybe he doesn't want to do that. So it's possible he climbed that hill and looked to the east. And if he did that, he would have seen Route 1322. And he would have seen light from some buildings off in that direction. And maybe he thought, where there's light, there's going to be help. And so maybe he starts walking in that direction. Now the problem is, to get where he was going, he would have had to have crossed a small creek. And with the weather as bad as it was, if he got wet... That would have essentially sealed his fate and accelerated this potential problem that he was having with being cold and suffering from hypothermia. And it might also explain why his body hasn't been found yet, because he's not walking down the road back towards Luling. He's actually headed off in a different direction altogether. And talking to Jason's dad, it's our understanding that some of the searches are going to start heading in that direction to see if maybe that's something he did, and if maybe they can hit upon something there. Now, I think both of those explanations, they, they're they nice and simple, and they seem to account for everything, and they don't involve anything too crazy happening. I still, though, the thing that I don't understand, and I'm just going to go back to what I've been repeating again and again, I don't understand why he would grab his backpack and not his cell phone. I don't understand why he would be thinking clearly enough to grab his backpack but leave his cell phone behind and then take all his clothes off in the middle of the road. Like To me, I just don't know if there's enough time for all of these things to have happened such that it would make sense that he would do that. Now, maybe he was just so delirious that he just grabbed his backpack almost by 
like wrote. He grabbed the backpack and he grabbed the fish and he wasn't thinking and he stumbled down the road and then he dropped both of those and he took his clothes off and wandered off. I mean, that's that's possible and maybe that's even likely, but to me that is just a such a strange detail that I can't really account for. You know, I, I don't think that he was the victim of a crime either before or after the crash. I think all signs point to something natural in the sense that he was in control of what was happening. But like you said, the fact that everything's left behind and his clothes are left behind and he's, from what we understand, probably naked at the point of him taking off clothes. I don't think it's possible he had other clothes and he changed into something warmer, but why would you not change in the safety of your car where at least you're shielded partway from the wind? Why would you change in the middle of the road? That makes no sense. I think there is a huge gaping hole of something we don't understand um, that if we had that information, it would explain a lot more of why Jason made the decisions that he did. And when you don't know anything, you can only grasp upon the little bits of the pieces of the story you know. And one thing that just really stuck out for me when speaking to Jason's dad was his mention of how difficult this year had been, especially his living conditions with, I think, roommates who he didn't hang out with um, a lot just because they had different schedules, um, coupled with the um, kind of repeated um the repeated quarantines. My understanding was they were happened very close in succession. He was in quarantine for, you know, several weeks, maybe up to a month, went home uh, for one of those two trips home. And then as soon as he got back, you know, was made aware that he, there had been an exposure risk and he had to go back into quarantine. So my understanding is those were back to back quarantines right before this trip home. And we don't know whether that had anything to do with where he was emotionally or mentally, but with the little information we know, that ser- that certainly stood out to me. So, Alice, we've talked a lot about this case, and we've talked a lot about what people can do to try and help reach some conclusion here. And, and like we said, if you have information, we hope that you'll reach out to somebody, but... At the end of the day, it doesn't all fall to the true crime community to solve these cases. The police are involved. Obviously, the district attorney is involved. And when we talked to Jason's father, you know, one of the questions we had was, what What do you think should happen next? And in addition to the searches, which are obviously ongoing, he actually, he was a lawyer, and he knows how these things work. And he actually did have a couple of suggestions that we wanted to talk about. And one of them is a geofence warrant. Now, we've talked about this a little bit before. If you guys listen to our Delphi episodes, you may remember that there was discussion of a geofence warrant, whether it happened and what it showed. And in this case, essentially what Jason's dad is asking for is is a warrant that would allow the police to see all the people who had a cell phone on them at the time in the area where Jason was missing. And because this road is so little traveled, I think the thought is if there is another person on that road around the same time as when Jason was there, that might tell us something. Now, Alice, I know you've had some experience with these geofence warrants. Can you explain for the listeners, kind of how these work. Absolutely. So some of you may be thinking, oh my goodness, if you can get a warrant for where every cell phone was in this area, does that mean we just all have little tracking devices on us? Yes and no. So as you probably know, if you have a cell phone and most smartphones will have some sort of notification that pops up and says, you know, can this app track your location? You may get that on Um, apps that clearly need your location, like Maps, you know, Waze, Google Maps. And then there will be apps that don't seem like they need it, right? Facebook, Instagram, they really just use the location device so they can add that little tag where it's like, you know, Alice checked in at the Oyster Bar in, you know, New Orleans, Louisiana, something like that. But there's not really a need for them to have location. But for all these apps, it is really profitable for them to know more about you. And knowing where you are, you know, what demographics uh, listen or use their products is really helpful for them. And so because of that, you probably have a lot of apps, almost all of them, who ask for and sometimes default into tracking your location. 
Now, I say all this because if your phone is turned off or you have all location tracking devices turned off on your apps or your phone is in airplane mode or otherwise basically your phone is not working as a smartphone should, you will not be picked up in a geofence warrant. The geofence warrant isn't actually reaching out and looking for phones. Rather, it's every time your phone is basically touching a satellite. So you're making a call, you're using an app, um, a location monitoring service is on on one of your apps. And by the way, this is why it's so it's so powerful is because a lot of these apps and their location tracking devices are on even when you're not actively using the app. And as a result, functionally, almost every cell phone is being tracked unless you take very intentional measures to make your cell phone not tracked. Now, whenever those services that I'm talking about are being used and touch a satellite, it's captured and stored for some period of time by different service providers like Google. And they'll store it for, I don't know how many days, 30, 60, 90 days, you know, it depends if they are then asked to preserve it if there's an ongoing investigation. And a warrant is essentially telling this private provider that we know you have satellite data of every device that touched in this area. And because your satellite acts as a sort of 3D map and can map people within an area, we want that data. And that is called a geofence. Because imagine it's a like a cyber fence that's fencing you to where your location is. If you think of a movie, you know, like a scientific movie, you're standing in the middle of a field, you turn on your phone and it pings all these different satellites. It's just the nearest satellite because of pinging those satellites and what is it? Geometry? <laughs> I don't even know the, the proper trigonometry. <laughs> trigonometry. Trigonometry, much better. It can pinpoint almost exactly where you are. And because Jason, and, and Jason's dad, as we said, was an attorney, so he has a very deep understanding of this type of data, the reason this would work in a rural area, like where Jason was, Jason's car was found, is not many people should be traveling through Luling, Texas. Not many people should be traveling through this salt flat road that's really not going to the interstate. It's in the middle of nowhere. So if you have a limited time frame, and we have one here, right? We have about an hour from the time he turned off his ways, so his tracking device, to the time the off-duty firefighter found his car. So if you could find all the cell phones that were in this area, it might give you a lead to someone who may have seen something and not known it was significant. So you can go talk to them. Or if um, Jason had been met with some ill will, it could give you a list of suspects. So basically, I see geofence warrants used when you are at a loss and you're at a blank slate and you have nowhere to go. There's lots of dead ends and you're just trying to get some leads. Now, you may be thinking, but that sounds like a huge invasion of privacy, right, Brett? And we care about the Constitution here. So why don't we just throw out geofence warrants all the time? Now that I've explained it, you know, why isn't Jason's family getting this geofence warrant left and right? Why not? Well, so we do care about the Constitution. And there was a time when your cell phone data was not considered to be private. And the idea was, you know, if you're walking down the street with a sign that says, you know, my name is Brett, follow me, then, you know, the police don't need a warrant for that information. They can just watch you walk down the street and follow you everywhere you go. And the thought was, you have this cell phone, it's sending out that data at all times. You don't have a privacy interest in that because you're just constantly broadcasting where you are. But at some point, the Supreme Court, in a case called Carpenter, decided that this sort of old-fashioned way of thinking about cell phones just did not work because the cell phone tracks every moment of every day, everywhere that you are, unless you take some pretty serious precautions to avoid it. If you guys listen to Big Mad True Crime, they always say that if your cell phone's off, you're either being murdered or you're murdering someone. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like, how often do you turn your cell phone off? Almost never. Unless it runs out of battery, you're, you know, your cell phone's on and it's tracking you. So the Supreme Court essentially said, 
you know, used to, you could just ask the cell phone company for that information and they had to give it to the police and they could track you ever they wanted to. Now you need a warrant. And because you need a warrant, the privacy interest of the people who are going to be implicated by that warrant matter. And there's a couple things to look at. Even if you're a suspect in a murder, you still have privacy interests. Now, the fact that you're a suspect in a murder and the probable cause that you were involved in committing that crime overcomes your privacy interest, allows the government to get a warrant and see your information. But as Alice said, with a geofence warrant, we're not just talking about the suspect. Even if we think whoever we find in the box is going to be a suspect, what if there are two people? One of them is completely innocent, at least, right? And you're asking for the right to invade that person's privacy, to know where that person was, and really any person who comes through that area. So judges are very, they're very skeptical of these warrants because of the information they provide and because the number of people that will be involved in it. You know, if you have a case, for instance, where you're asking for one of these and you're close to the interstate and you're going to be capturing thousands of people's data, you're out of luck. There aren't a lot of judges who are going to give you that because it seems so invasive of so many people. The argument that Jason's dad is making is, look, this is very narrow. We're not asking for that much information. It won't capture that much information. It's a narrow period of time, an hour tops. It's a narrow geographical area, this sort of middle of the nowhere road. And all that seems very reasonable, but there is one big problem. If you're going to seek one of these, you need to have some evidence that a crime was committed. Remember, that's the whole point. You're investigating a crime. You need a warrant to get information about that crime. And the district attorney in this case does not believe that there was any foul play involved in this case. And because of that, they don't actually think they can get this warrant. Alice mentioned the amount of time these companies keep this data. In this case, the specific data that Jason's dad wants appears to be kept for a year, which means we are coming up on when that data will be lost. And I think the other thing short of this that Jason's dad would like is a preservation order, which is different. All that does is tell the company, we're not sure if we need this. We're not sure if we can get it, but we want you to preserve it while we work it out. So don't delete this information so we can determine whether or not we need it. Imagine, for instance, if a year to the day after Jason went missing, they find his body and there's a gunshot wound. You know, he's been shot in the head. Well, then all of a sudden you got some pretty good evidence that the crime occurred here, right? And then you turn around and you go to the cell phone company and you're like, hey, give us that information. And they're like, sorry, 24 hours ago we deleted it all. And Jason's dad thinks that you just can't, you can't let this date pass without getting a preservation order. And I think that seems pretty reasonable to me. Yeah, that seems very reasonable because the the burden on the company is much lower. They don't have to produce it, so they don't have to review it for anything. You don't have to seek a court order. It's really just a please do this. And we see preservation letters sent out all the time, especially when it comes to private companies who keep their data for much less than a year or surveillance cameras. You can imagine a, a convenience store surveillance camera that may have caught something, but those are usually loops that uh, record over themselves because you know tape is uh, can be expensive for just a convenience store, so they don't keep it for more than, say, 24 hours. So oftentimes, you will see these preservation letters go out. And the thing is, it seems like a pretty simple step to be able to preserve a, a, a potentially very valuable um, information for down the road. Um, and investigations take a long time. And there may not be all the information gathered right now. Hopefully, as you know, you all hear this, maybe there are more people who know something who could give tips to the police. But even if the police decided tomorrow they wanted to seek this warrant, it's not like you turn around and just ask for the warrant. These are lengthy applications, as they should be. And, you know, they're, they're sworn testimonies of, of agents. Those do not get cobbled together in a matter of hours. And you may be asking yourself, why do they even need this warrant? They've got the cell phone. Can't they just look at the cell phone? Well, unfortunately, in another of those actions by the police that's really inexplicable, apparently when the police had the cell phone, the it was locked. 
and <laughs> rather than see if the parents or, or Jason's friends or anybody had the code, they just entered random numbers until essentially the phone locked itself and there was no way to open it. And what Jason's family had to do was they had to back up the phone or they had to find the backup. And fortunately, it was pretty recent backup, and they were able to reconstruct a lot of the information that we've told you. But they could only do it right up to that moment when Waze went off. So the phone, if they had gotten it in pristine condition, because, like Alice said, it's tracking you all the time. There's all sorts of information in your phone that you probably don't even know about. If they had gotten it then, they could have tracked Jason, at least, and they could have seen exactly where he went, and they could see how long he was there. They could see when the wreck occurred, all those sorts of pieces of information. Obviously, they couldn't see if there was anybody else around, but they could see a lot of information that they they don't have now. Unfortunately, because the police kind of did this really, really, really dumb thing, and... There's not a lot of investigative options open at this point. We've talked about the rumor mill. There are rumors floating around town, but it doesn't seem like anybody actually has much information. There's not a lot of forensics. We've talked about that. And other than just brute force searching, really, just getting as many people out there as you can get and searching in a grid pattern in areas that you think it's more likely he'll be and stumbling upon the body after a year... There's not a lot you can do to find anything. The only investigative angle you really have at this point is something like a geofence warrant. I don't know if they're ever going to get it because they're not going to find any more evidence of uh, foul play unless they find the body. And unfortunately, at this point, unless you do have that, a gunshot wound to the head, for instance, you may not have evidence of foul play then, even if it happened. You're just not going to have, there's not going to be a lot left. I mean, this is a body that's been in the elements for over a year in Texas with the animals and the, and the heat and the cold and everything else. So this is really all you've got. And it would be nice if there were some way to, to balance those privacy interests that everybody has and this, the interest this family has in closure. If you do this geofence warrant, and the only cell phone that pings is Jason's. It's not proof positive that nobody else was driving down that road. It's not proof positive that nobody hijacked him. But the likelihood is it means he was alone. The likelihood is there wasn't some killer out there with a the cell phone turned off and, and who killed Jason and got away with it. So it would be nice if they could get that kind of closure. Given the sort of legal issues, though, I just don't know that it's going to happen. Right. And, you know, this is why we're doing this case at this time uh, in hopes that someone knows something, because like Brett says, they've kind of reached the end of their investigative um, leads and they, they're going to need some new information they didn't previously know to be able to further investigate. But otherwise, there there is not reason really at this point to get the geofence warrant. Yeah, it's an interesting case, and it's a sad case. And talking to Jason's dad, it's sad because, you know, at this point, there's there's not a lot of there's not a lot of hope here. There's not even as much hope, really, as like in the Maura Murray case, where there are these theories that she ran off to start a new life. Jason didn't run off to start a new life. We didn't mention that as a possibility, but that's not what he did. And I think, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, I don't I don't know. It, it's I don't know what. <laughs> Talk about a difficult decision. I'm not sure what you would rather be the case. Would you rather this be someone doing something terrible? I mean, is that better somehow than just this inexplicable accident where just all these things went wrong at the wrong time and, and put him in this situation? Um, but I think, I don't think there's foul play here either. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I don't think there's foul play. I don't think anybody kidnapped him. I don't think he was carjacked. I don't think he was robbed. He was not a drug dealer. I just think he was a normal kid who was dealing with a difficult time because of COVID. And so he'd taken a few drugs, but he wasn't a drug dealer. I don't think he was on drugs that night. I don't think he was drunk. I think this police officer was full of it. I think Jason was just driving home. It was late and he was driving home and he came to the light in a town he wasn't familiar with in the dark and he went straight instead of turning right. 
And if he'd have turned right, we wouldn't be talking about him today. He would have made it home and everything would have been fine. But he didn't. He went straight. And because he went straight, he ended up it just down the middle of this road. And it's just crazy. It's just crazy to think that five miles down the road from a town could that could end your life. I mean, that's such a it's sad and it's crazy. And and I don't I don't have any words of comfort for Jason's family, but I do hope that these searches are successful. I hope they lead to some more information. And I hope that if there's anybody out there who has any information that you share it with Jason and his family, they deserve that. And look, we've said we don't think there was foul play, but that doesn't mean there wasn't. And if there was, somebody knows something and something, somebody in Luling knows something. And if you're one of those people, reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you and hear more about it. And we'd love to hear your thoughts in general on this case. You know how to reach us, prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Come join us on Patreon if you're sick of ads. You can get ad-free episodes and live get vocals with us. We love hanging out with those guys once a month, and we'd love to hang out with you as well. And if you do enjoy the show, we hope that you tell your friends, and we hope that you leave those five-star reviews on Apple. Well, Alice, do you have anything else you want to say before we sign off for today? No, just that you know. I think Jason's family has a lot of strength, but they've had to really walk through a living hell this past year. And I hope for their sake um, and for Jason's sake that they get closure sooner rather than later. It would be amazing if it could be, you know, before a whole year has been reached where they don't know what happened. So if you know something, thanks for listening. You guys often ask for cases that are new that need more attention. Well, um, I know this got a lot of coverage in Texas, but I don't think it got much coverage outside of Texas. So thank you for listening. And, um, Thank you for bringing this to our attention as well. And I'll say this, and we talked to Jason's dad, as we've said, and I was very, I was very impressed with him on a lot of different levels. I mean, as a father myself, I don't, I honestly, I don't know how you have that much strength in the face of something as just awful as this, but he does. And he is, he's committed to finding his son, Whatever it takes, and wherever the path leads, he he wants to follow it, and he's very impressive. And I pray that he does reach some sort of conclusion. Do want to thank Anna for bringing this case to our attention. As Alice said, it's not a very well covered case, but Anna pointed it out to us, and we looked into it and thought this is really interesting. Want to do it? If you guys have cases you want to hear. Send us an email. Most of you have not been shy about that, but we're always looking to cover cases. We've got a huge long list of cases. If you've sent us a case, it's on the list somewhere, and we're going to get to it eventually. But shoot us an email. Let us know. If you're a patron, You know we have a tagged post where you can leave your suggestions. We'll try and get to you guys quickly as well. If you're on Reddit, you go to the Prosecutors Podcast Reddit page, which we did not set up. Some fans set up. And thank you to those listeners. There's a tagged post there as well, or you can send us an email, Prosecutors Pod. Let us know the cases you want to hear, and we will get to them. Well, Alice, that's all we have for this week, but we'll be back next week with a new case, and new questions, and hopefully new answers. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. didn't know what you were talking about it's okay it's like it's like when my son um slips into like real deep south um accent because he has a sweet teacher from from mississippi and it's like the sweetest accent and it sounds so weird because it's just certain words that he has a twang
And so on December on December 14th, 